Flavio Leone, and I'm a senior geophysicist with Western GECO. The title of this e-lecture is Depth Domain Inversion, a least squares migration approach to quantitative interpretation. In this presentation, I will talk about the challenge posed by irregular illumination to seismic imaging and reservoir characterization, particularly in complex geological setting. And I will introduce an inversion technique to overcome this challenge. This is the outline of my talk. I will start with a problem definition, and this is how residual wave propagation effects are going to have a detrimental effect on imaging at the reservoir level, and therefore affect the interpretation of amplitude changes. I will then explain how this problem can be addressed by depth domain inversion, and we'll discuss the relationship between depth domain inversion and an image domain approach to least squares migration. And finally, I will conclude with a case study from the North Sea. Quantitative interpretation workflows assume that the variations in seismic amplitude are directly linked to variations in the underlying rock properties, and that all the wave propagation effects have been compensated for during processing. When this assumption is met, it is possible to derive stationary deterministic operators to link the angle-dependent earth reflectivity directly to the seismic amplitudes. And this is a key input for seismic AVO inversion. However, very often, such propagation effects have not been compensated for. Whilst for absorption and ghost, there are uh, plenty of techniques to address them throughout the seismic data processing, illumination is rarely considered. However, its impact is not negligible on seismic amplitude at target level, particularly in situation of complex uh, geological settings in the overburden. If we were able to model these illumination effects, then we could remove them from the seismic image and perform an inversion to estimate directly the reflectivity of the Earth. And this is what a least squares migration in the image domain does. The starting point is the seismic image, which is the result of the action of the migrator operator to the recorded data. The link between this migrated image and the Earth's reflectivity is represented by this Hessian operator. This controls the amount of blurring that a point scatterer in the reflectivity model would exhibit in the image. Image domain least squares migration uses point threat functions, or PSFs, to capture the deep and azimuth-dependent effects due to the acquisition geometry and the complex velocity model. Point threat functions are effectively 3D wavelets. They are a representation of the spatially variant 3D wavelet embedded in the migrated image, and they replace the 1D time and space invariant deterministic operator that is conventionally used in time domain AVO inversion. This is how the workflow for image domain least squares migration look like. Point threat functions are a function of the acquisition geometry, which is known, and of the velocity model that was estimated for imaging. The image domain least squares migration workflow finds a reflectivity model that minimizes, in a least square sense, the difference between the seismic image and the convolution of the point threat functions with such reflectivity model, returning a least square migrated image. As in some places the reflectivity model is known, where we have wells, Point threat functions can be calibrated to the wall reflectivity to invert directly for acoustic or elastic properties. The ability to calibrate point threat functions to the available uh, well data has a lot of advantages. First of all, we, we can make sure that we are calibrating uh, the spectrum of the point threat functions to the spectrum of the reflectivity. And this ensures optimal deconvolution, which is going to increase the frequency content of the least squares migrated image and reduce the risk of uh, ringing or loss of low frequency content. Finally, the ability to constrain the inversion to a realistic background model also helps the inversion to converge faster. I'm now going to demonstrate the application of depth domain inversion to a seabed dataset from the Norwegian continental shelf. In this situation, the reservoir was represented by middle Jurassic sandstones, and the complexity in the overburden was represented by near seabed channels, as well as cemented sand injectites. Particularly, cemented sand injectites pose a real challenge for seismic imaging. They are commonly present in the North Sea, and they show a very complex geometry with variable thickness and very high velocity in comparison to the uh, sediments around. Such cemented sun injectites cause structural pull-ups and amplitude distortions underneath. And this is a problem both for imaging as well as for reservoir characterization. In this slide, we can see an example of depth migrated image underneath a cemented sand injectite right in the middle. The presence of the distortions underneath the injectite are clearly visible from this migrated section. This is how the velocity model looks like for this particular section. 
it is a non-trivial problem to estimate an accurate velocity field in the presence of sand injectites. Travel time tomography will show some sensitivity uh, to these bodies. However, at the typical scale of, of updates from uh, tomography, the resolution is not sufficient to properly capture the details of these uh, high-velocity geobodies. Uh, full waveform inversion, on the other hand, will also be sensitive. However, uh, it depends on how deep these bodies are and in comparison to the maximum offset of the geometry of the acquisition. Uh, a very commonly used approach is to actually manually insert these geobodies into the velocity model once they've been either manually interpreted or estimated by a post-stack acoustic inversion and then identified through Bayesian classification. And this is what has been done in this particular case. Once we have a reliable velocity model that we can trust, we can use it to compute the point spread functions. And from this image, it's clearly visible uh, the detrimental effect that these injectites are causing to the image underneath, where the point spread functions show a dimming in amplitude, a loss in frequency content, and some dips are not illuminated as well as the nearby point spread functions that don't have this problem caused by the injectite. These are now some RMS amplitude map after depth imaging for two key horizons underneath the injectites. I've put on these maps the location of the geobodies. And if I now remove them, it is very easy to see the big distortion that is caused by uh, particularly the larger injectites, but also some of the smaller ones that have not com been completely undershot. If I now compare these RMS amplitude maps with the same amplitude maps after least square migration in the image domain, you can see that the amplitude underneath the injectite has been very well compensated and some key geological features that before were hidden in the noise caused by injectites are now coming back up. So you can see, for example, better fault continuity and in general, a better amplitude behavior. If we now look what is happening on the seismic section, here we see an inline and a cross line uh, of the Kirchhoff depth migrated image. If we compare this with the least squares migration image, you can see a number of things happening. First of all, underneath the injectites, the amplitude is very well recovered and you can see that the effect of the distortion has been pretty much removed. You also see uh, an increase in resolution, which is caused by the deconvolution of the seismic image with the point spread function. And finally, you see an improved continuity of the events. The next step of the workflow is to calibrate the point spread functions at the available well locations and to perform a depth domain inversion directly to acoustic and elastic properties. In the next slides, I'm going to show the comparison between the depth domain inversion result and the result of a conventional seismic inversion in the time domain. This is what the inversion in the time domain looks like. On the box on the right hand side, you can see the wavelets extracted at these four wells. And it's immediately visible the fact that whilst for three of these four wells, the size of the wavelets were actually fairly comparable, one of them has a different amplitude behavior. And this is down to the different illumination that takes place at this place in the subsurface. Because of this, we cannot easily identify a single deterministic operator that can link the reflectivity to seismic amplitudes. And therefore, when we do perform an acoustic inversion, we can see that for the three out of the four wells where the wavelet was consistent, we get good results. Whereas at well number four, we are now uh, overestimating the contrast in acoustic impedance. If we compare these results with the result of the inversion in the depth domain, now we can see that amplitudes are better balanced for all wells. The acoustic impedance contrasts are much better represented. The image has higher resolution and also better low frequency content. The next step of the workflow is to perform a depth domain AVO inversion and then a Bayesian classification to identify the key lithologies present in the reservoir and the presence of hydrocarbons. This slide shows the acoustic impedance versus VPVS ratio cross plot and you can easily identify the key sands and shale lithologies, and you can notice the effect of hydrocarbons that moves uh, the sand points down to the left, where the discrimination with the non-reservoir lithology is now fully in the VPVS ratio. On this slide, you can see on the top left, the lithology classification cube. On the bottom left, you can see the hydrocarbon probability, and then on the right-hand side, a 3D view of the hydrocarbon sand probability. These are the results of a conventional time domain AVO inversion. If you look where the injectites are, you can see that the, uh, the hydrocarbon probability has been distorted by the presence of the injectites, and therefore the mapping of the reservoir is discontinuous. If we compare these results with the depth domain AVO inversion, we can now see that with this technique, we were able 
to properly estimate the hydrocarbon probability sands underneath the injectites, and this gives a more continuous and geologically sound characterization of the reservoir for this particular data set. In conclusion, variable illumination effects can be modeled using point threat functions and then compensated by an image domain least squares migration. Point threat functions can be calibrated to the well reflectivity to invert directly for elastic properties, and this has a number of advantages that makes the results much more re reliable and easier to parameterize. And this finally leads to improved seismic imaging and improved reservoir characterization. I would like to acknowledge AkerVP and their partners in the Eva Rasen license for the permission to show this data. And I would like to thank my colleagues Krishna Ramani, Ole Jornaskim, and Oivin Runde for their collaboration throughout the study. For these and other e-lectures, visit the EAG YouTube channel.